I am going to give you a second to open to Psalm 24. Today, our psalm breaks into three major groups. The first section is verses 1 through 2. Oh yeah, Gary, does anybody need a Bible? Yes, and it's my gift to you. <laughs> Don't ever say I haven't given you something. Awesome, thank you. See, I get all caught up. I'm so excited about going through the Word of God. It just like gives me goosebumps. I can't wait to read it. Because this power, man, it is like... So let's read our psalm. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Jesus, is that you? It's not my phone. Mine's on silent. <laughs> who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul into vanity or nor sworn deceitfully? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. O oh, Jacob, think about these things. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates, and lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let that sink in. That's what Selah means. So we've got three sections in this psalm. We can just draw lines through them. The first section is verses 1 and 2. God is recognized as the holy ruler and undisputed owner of all the earth to do with as he pleases. Amen? It is. The second section is verses 3 through 6. And it asks the question, who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Then it gives the answer. He who has clean hands, a pure heart, who does not worship idols or tell lies. Then it makes a promise. You will receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of your salvation. And it gives the purpose to the believer. We are God. If you are seeking after God, your purpose in your life is seeking God, you will receive these things. And the final section is verses 7 through 10. And it is a shouted chorus calling to the Lord the returning king of glory, and it was put to the trumpet with the people shouting with their hands in the air. This was a psalm of ascension. Do you guys know what that means? This is a psalm that was written for a specific moment in time in a specific instance at a specific day. It was written for the day when David was going to bring the Ark of the Covenant from the valley, from Obed-Edom's house all the way up to the temple in the city of David, to dwell with them at the tabernacle. So he wrote this psalm specifically for this day. But in order for you to get the full impact, for me to get the full impact of what the psalm is saying, we have to go back in our history. We have to learn what are the pieces, what are we talking about? How's it going? How did we get here? I mentioned this was written by David as a psalm of ascension, but where was it coming from and why is it being moved? And what is the Ark of the Covenant? You guys have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? I have. Great movie. I met Harrison Ford, by the way. But anyways. The tabernacle of the congregation and all of its furnished things were built during the first year that the Jews walked in the desert after God brought them out of Egypt. It included the Ark of the Testimony and covering the Ark was the mercy seat. These two pieces, they were the central pieces in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of the congregation. And between those two cherubim with their wings folded together, that's where God would appear upon the mercy seat. Look at Leviticus 16 too. And the Lord said to Moses, speak unto Aaron your brother that he does not come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark so that he does not die. I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Now, this was said by God after God had slain 
his two sons, Aaron's two sons, because they had brought false fire before God. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter of 16 of Leviticus to you and so that you can see what happens. But you're welcome to go read that. Or you can also read about Korah's rebellion. But believe me when I tell you that God is deadly serious about being in his presence without being there the way he has established. You cannot appear before the king of glory, before the God of heaven and earth, without doing things the way he said to do it. And that's because he loves you and he wants you to live. If you don't do it that way, you die. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter whose son you are. Doesn't matter what your lineage is. If you appear before God without doing it God's way, you die. Now on the mercy seat, the high priest would come in and sprinkle blood once a year on the day of atonement. He'd sprinkle blood for his own sin offering, for the high priest's sin offering. And then he would also sprinkle the atonement blood for the house of Israel. And this is the place where God would meet man in the holy of holies. It's the metaphysical, meta, metaphysical, metaphorical picture of Jesus. This is the place of intimacy with God. The ark was made of wood and it was covered with gold. 100% man, 100% God. The wood represented his humanity and his crucifixion coming. Right? That whole connection. And then the gold was his deity. And what I want to do today is draw your attention to the fact that the ark and Jesus is where the glory of God dwells. And we're going to talk about that as we learn from this. But the holy of holies is the place of intimacy with God. And holiness is required if you want to be in the presence of God. And I want to focus our minds on the idea of living in the presence of God and having the blessing in your life from being in the presence of God. People sought after God's glory. They wanted God's blessing because in God's presence is life and light and healing. In God's presence is where the enemies are put to flight. In God's presence is where we have victory in our life. And it's in this seeking the presence of God where we pick up the trail that's going to lead to the circumstances of David writing the 24th Psalm. So, remember that God's presence, his glory, was visible to Israel from the day they left Egypt. He was there, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when the cloud would rest on the tabernacle and move, when God wanted them to move. And for 40 years, it was in the wilderness. For 40 years, God's presence was with them every single day. He never left them. He was with them. And then during the days of Judges, when Joshua led Israel into the promised land, God had them carry the ark on their shoulders into the middle of the Jordan River at high season when it's over flooding and the water backed up and Israel crossed over on dry ground. And they took 12 stones out of the middle and they set up a pillar as a pillar of remembrance. And then they went from there. And they went and they marched around Jericho and they took the ark. And for seven days they marched around. And then with a shout and a blow of the trumpets, what happened? The walls fell down. So God's presence got them the victory. Now, once Israel entered into the promised land, you guys who study history, you know your Bible, they got comfortable. They fought battles. God helped them. They started taking, and then it started getting harder and they kind of gave up and they kind of backed off and they said, you know what? We got enough land. Everything's good. And they got comfortable. And when they got comfortable, they started compromising. And when they got started compromising, they started intermarrying with the people of the land. They started taking on their gods and their idols. And they forgot about intimacy with God and they forgot about the ark. So, God did what he does to all of us who he loves and he started correcting them. He started throwing small pedibles at first. Just like, dink, trying to get their attention, right? Dink, little log. And then he goes, oh, they're not listening. Bigger rock. Bunk. Bunk. And then they got even a bigger rock. Bunk. See, I, uh, see that's not a bald spot. <laughs> that's from rocks hitting my head. See, I know what God's correction tastes like. I know what it feels like. You know when you hit yourself and you, like, you taste electricity in your mouth? Yeah, that's it. 
You go, oh yeah, Lord, I need to repent. I'm, yes. So God tried to get them to repent back to him and God sent hard times on Israel. So God rose up the Philistines against them in the midst of them losing a battle to the Philistines. Someone had a brilliant idea. Let's go look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Verse 3. When the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Somebody had this idea. Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hand of the enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and they brought forth the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwells between the cherubims. You see, he's still there. The glory's there. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And verse 5, And when the, Lord, when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so the earth rang out. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said to themselves, What does this mean, this noise, this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And then they understood that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing up until this point. Woe to us! Who will deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? Aren't these the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness? You see, it's not just in the Bible, that story. Israel's firstborn... That made the evening news. Like Israel, or Israel, Egypt's firstborn dying, that made the evening news of every nation around the area. E Egypt was the, king, the world power of the day. And when all their firstborn died, people knew what happened. When all those plagues happened during Moses while he was trying to get them out, everybody knew what was going on. And so the Philistines know this is the God that did that. Woe unto us. Nothing like this has ever happened to us. Woe unto us. And so the generals got up and they said, verse 9, to their men, Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O you Philistines, that, you're not, that you be not servants unto the Hebrews like they have been unto you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. We don't talk like that anymore. Be a man. I love that. Be a man. Okay. I had five kids. I watched movies. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man to his tent. And there was a great slaughter. And that day, 30,000 footmen fell in Israel. 30,000. 30,000 men. 30,000 fathers and brothers. Wives without husbands. Mothers without sons. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And then I want you to jump down to verse 17. Because a messenger runs from the battlefield and goes back to Shiloh and tells Eli, who was the judge at the time, the high priest. And the, judge, the messenger comes to Eli and he asks, how goes the battle? And in verse 17, the messenger says, Israel's fled from before the Philistines and there has been also a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons... Also, Hophni and Phinehas are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God, not his sons dying, but when the ark of God was taken, that he fell back off of the seat he was sitting on by the side of the gate, and he broke his neck and he died. For he was an old man and he was fat. And he had judged Israel for 40 years. And then verse 19, And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, she was with child. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law was dead, and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and began having birth pains and gave birth to a child. And right around the time that she died, the women tried to tell her, Do not fear, for you've born a son. But she couldn't answer because she was gone already. But, she died, but before she died, she named the child Ichabod, which means the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. 
they thought that the ark had magic power. Remember the Nazis took the ark? They're like, it is a radio to God. We are going to use it as a weapon. We are going to, and they, you know, Belloc and Dr. Jones, do not blow up the ark, right? I'm going to blow it up, right? They considered it had magic powers. But in reality, all of us who know our Bibles know it's not the ark that brings power. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the presence of God that brings the power in the life of his people. It's not some relic. So, the ark goes on a tour of the cities of the Philistines. Worldwide tour. Tonight only showing, come see the ark. They thought they had a trophy. They thought they had the Stanley Cup. Woohoo, we've got Israel's ark. Woohoo, right? And they bring it up and they set it up in their temple and they're going to, you know, show it off and all the stuff. Now, ladies, do you guys like rats? Do you guys like rats? I mean, it, like lots of rats, not just one pet rat. I'm talking like rats in the middle of the night, crawling up into your bed, chewing your toes, like rats getting in all your cabinets, getting in all your food, all that stuff. Guys, do you like hemorrhoids? <laughs> Does anybody like hemorrhoids? I mean, they're a real pain in the butt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everywhere the ark went, the rats came too. The rats infested the cities. And all the ladies loved it. They slept so peacefully every night with all those rats running around. And all the men had hemorrhoids. It was a great celebration. But as you would think, you know, the government sent the ark to the next town. They're like, well, maybe it's the location. So we're going to send the ark to the next town. So the, the president of, Philist of the Philistines, he sent the ark to the next town. And when the ark comes, at first they think, yeah, we've got the ark. And then they're like, oh, man, this is a real pain. And the ladies are freaking out. Oh, there's rats everywhere. And the men can't walk. And they're like, seven and it goes through all these cities of the Philistines and finally they get to the point after seven months they're like we got to send this ark back we do not want this <laughs> they get to the point where when the government sent the ark to their town they're like they've sent death to us why why have they done this so they send the ark back and they say well let's make sure that it's from God that this is God thing so they said we're going to put the ark on a new cart and we're going to take these cows who have just given birth to these little baby calves and are totally engorged. Their udders are engorged and their swords are swollen. And these cows are feeding on them. But we're going to take those two cows and hitch them up to this cart. And if when we let them go, the cows go straight away back to Israel, we know that it's the God of Israel that brought this upon us. But if they turn to the side and feed their calves, then we know maybe we're doing something wrong with the ark. And they cut the cattle loose. Do you know what happens? They bolt for Israel. They don't care about the little cows they left behind. They don't care about their udders scraping on the dirt. They are bolting for Israel. And they're like, wow. And they follow the ark. They follow it into the land of Israel. And it comes to the town of Beth Shemesh. And 1 Samuel 6 has the whole story. I'm not going to read it to you. But in summary, it says that the ark came up over the hill. And the men looked up and they're like, the ark of God is back, right? Like, go, they, this is winning. They think they're winning. So they, they get the ark of God. They call the Levites down and the Levites take the ark off the cart and they take the gold and they go, yeah, we got gold for God's temple. And then um, the rats and the hemorrhoids, they made gold offerings to God as so I left that part out. Sorry about that. But they bring that off the cart. And then the men say, okay, let's take the cart. And we'll make it into wood. And we'll have this big rock here. We'll light this wood on fire. And we'll cook the cows. And we'll offer it to God. We'll have communion with God. And we'll have this great sacrifice and do all this stuff. And then they're like, somebody got the great idea of, hey, man, let's look in the ark. Yeah, dude, let's do it. Look at Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 6, 19 through 20. I'm going to put it on the overhead for you. He smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of God. He smote of the people 50,000 threescore and ten men. 50,070 men died because they looked in the ark of God. So it's just like the end of Indiana Jones, right? Only it's probably more intense. 
But it didn't matter that they were of Israel. They had violated the holy treaty, the covenant of God. Like, this is a holy thing. You do not do this. You are not qualified to do this. So then the men of Beth Shemeth said this. They said, who is able to stand before this holy God? And to whom shall he go from us? In other words, who can dwell with it? Now remember this saying, because it comes up in our psalm. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Look at 1 Samuel 7, 1 through 4. So they said, who can it go up from that it can dwell there? And then they called up the men of kirjath Jerarim, And they came and they fetched the ark of the Lord. And they brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill. And sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in kirjath Jerarim, that the time was long. And it was long. It was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spoke unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange God and Ashtoreths from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtoreth, and served the Lord only. And God gave them success. Do you see the ark there? No. It was them learning a very hard lesson. 50,000 men. More than died with the battle of the Philistines, right? Now, Israel had to learn this hard lesson, and under Samuel's leadership, they had rejected idolatry and sought the Lord God only and God blessed them with victory. But as all you guys know who do history, over time, the people ended up rejecting God as their king. And they said, we want a king like all the other countries have. We want a man to rule over us. And so God gave them Saul. Saul to be the king. And then Saul failed to trust and obey the Lord. So God rose up David from out of the sheepfold to be the king. God blessed David. He fought Goliath and won. He fights many, many other battles and he wins the hearts of Israel with his bravery, godliness, and integrity. He marries Saul's daughter and Saul tries to kill him for years to come. David has to flee to the woods. He has to flee to other countries and finally after years and years of struggle, Saul stops pursuing after David. And then at the end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies and his son Jonathan dies. And then David is crowned king over the tribe of Judah in Hebron. And then he's struggling again with the legacy of Saul, with another son and with, their, with the generals that were left behind. And after a short struggle with them and battles and fighting ensues, David finally gets crowned king over all Israel in Hebron. And then... David goes and he does another battle and he goes and he takes the fortress at Zion. And when he takes the fortress at Zion, he moves in and he calls it the city of David. And it's just to the south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. When you guys go to Jerusalem, Israel this year with Waxer, if you go, you will tour the city of David. It's there. You go down the stairs and you see rooms and paintings still on the wall that they've dug up from the city of David. It is awesome. You got to do it. You even get to walk through Hezekiah's tunnel that he dug for the water. Oh, dude. So cool. Anyway, he is living in tune with God's lead. Whenever he goes to a battle, he inquires of the Lord and God gives him favor. God tells him all the secrets of what's going on with the enemy. And he goes, go over here, do this. Wait, now go over here, do this. Okay, now wait until the wind starts blowing. Now go. Okay, now stop and go over here. And David wins every single battle. And so he's living in his castle. He's got peace in his land. And in 2 Samuel 5.25, turn with me there. This is going to be our next text that we're going to look at. David did as the Lord had commanded him, and he smote the Philistines from Gibeah until you come to Gezer. So David had peace. All of the enemies that he was fighting, all that, all that noise going on in his life, he had complete peace. 
And it's at this time when he's in his castle and he's reminiscing about being a shepherd that he writes Psalm 23. That's when he writes the psalm. And he's reminiscing about it and he's thinking back about the blessing of God's presence. And David's like, you know what? I really want to have a more intimate relationship with God. I really want to have the blessing of God's presence. I've got a great idea. I am going to go get the ark of God, of the Lord who dwells between the cherubim. And so, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baale of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called the name of the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubims. Still there. Remember the glory is still there. And they set the ark upon a new cart and he brought it out of the house of Abinadab that it's been there for 20 years that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab drove the cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah accompanying the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood even on tarps on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels on coronets and on cymbals and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor Uzzah put out his hand onto the ark of God to stabilize it because the ark shook, the, the cart shook when the oxen were pulling it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? And he would not bring the ark into the city of David, but David carried it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, did David make a mistake? Yeah, somebody had died. Why was David upset? Because he's the king. He's supposed to be the guy, the anointed one. God's blessing him. And here he's doing this thing and this guy dies. And everybody's seeing it happen. What an embarrassment. Wouldn't that be, if I was doing something and... It would cause me to think, like consider my ways, to put it lightly. And so David says the same thing the men of Beth Shemesh said, right? Who can dwell with this holy God? And instead of just like sending it away and not thinking about it again, he goes, I'm going to send it over to Obed's house, Obed-Edom's house. Let's see what happens. Right? <laughs> But the thing is, Obed-Edom was like, yeah, bring it. I've got nothing to hide. Because if you don't have anything to hide, God's presence is awesome. Yeah, man, if you're innocent, I love hanging out with God. Multiplies bread, multiplies fish, water comes out of a rock. I get manna every morning. Everything goes my, dude, every day is sunshine. Are you kidding me? Even the worst day is the greatest day if God's with you. Who cares? So, amen. So David is seeing this. And he sees that Obed-Edom's house is being blessed. And he's like, what did I do wrong? It's my fault that Uzzah died. What has happened? Well, we see what happens as he writes Psalm 24. That's where we're going to go. But look at 2 Samuel 6, 11 first before we leave. It says, The ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And it, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. And it was told King David saying, Hey man, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertained to him because of the ark of God. Of course, because of the presence of the Lord, right? And David, in that little space right there, Time goes by between the ark of God and then there's a period and it says so in that verse. Time's going by and David writes Psalm 24. Right there. And so then we look and he, we realize like, oh my gosh, David, what did you do wrong? And he takes 
this whole thing and he goes through and he considers his ways and he's thinking to himself and he goes, okay, Psalm 24, one, let's read it in this new context. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell in it for he has founded it upon the seas and he has established it upon the floods. David says, I want to be blessed by God. I want to have a closer relationship with God. David is recognizing that God is large and in charge. That's right. That's right. And Pastor Waxer has done such a great job of teaching you guys these slang, sayings, slangs, sayings, that's like the, sayings of principles that are so true. God is large and in charge. But that's what this verse says. This last week, um, Bruce did a devotion on Jeremiah 27, 5, and it's this psalm that God quotes and says to Zedekiah through Jeremiah. And so God over and over says, I am the one who created the heavens and the earth. I do whatever I want with it. And so David, in saying this psalm, is recognizing that God is in charge. He's repenting and humbly bowing before the Lord God Almighty. He is publicly recognizing that God is above all and that all is creation to do with as he pleases. And if David wants to come to God, David has to do it the way God established. And that's what that's saying. He is reducing himself and exalting God. Look at 2 Psalm, uh, Samuel uh, 6, 12, the, the second half there. And we're going to put our fingers between Psalm 24 and Samuel, 2 Samuel 6. We'll go back and forth a couple times. 2 Samuel 6, 12b. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Did you see gladness in the other time he tried? Nope. What do you think the, uh, just reflecting back here, what do you think the dress code was for the first time David had all the men, his 30,000 chosen men and all of his brothers from Judah bringing the ark up? Do you think David dressed in his kingly regalia? Absolutely. All of the new musical instruments they brought? Sure. They had a new cart. They had all the musical instruments. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance. But this second time, it mentions that it's with gladness. And then in verse 13, it was so that when they had bore the ark of the Lord and had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. So you see, David had asked the same question as the men of Beth Shemesh. The men, the 50,000, the ones that were still left alive after 50,000 died. They said, who will stand before this holy God? And David did his research and he found the answer. In those three months, he searched the scriptures and he found what he needed to do. If he wanted to have intimate fellowship with God, there was only one thing to do, to exalt the holiness of God. All of the earth is the Lord's and all of the fullness therein. And it's his to do with as he wishes. And David humbled himself. How do I know that? Look at the verse 14. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded in a linen ephod. Well, what does that mean? We'll look down at verse 20. David's wife, Michal, Saul's daughter, she watched him out of the window from the castle as he danced before the Lord, as they were bringing it up. And look what she says. Oh, how glorious the king of Israel was today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of all the handmaidens of his servants as if he was like one of the vain fellows that shamelessly uncovers himself. That's King James for, dude, you're like in street clothes. Like what? You're wearing your underwear, like dancing around. And David comes back and says, I will humble myself even more. I mean, God is great. But this is what I'm telling you, that God saw David exalt God's holiness and humble himself. So he was not in kingly attire. It was the humble clothing of the street person and it was God's good pleasure to dwell with him. 
You don't see any threat, no worries, no fear. David's offering sacrifice as a blessing. David's dancing unto the Lord as a blessing. And we're going to read right here that it said, all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting. Not just the 30,000 chosen men. Not just those who were from Judah that were his buddies. All of Israel was involved in this. And they brought it up with shouting and trumpets. Trumpets. Like they blew at the walls of Jericho. Like when they rebuilt the walls and Nehemiah gave them trumpets to blow if they needed help. It's the symbol of prayer and calling out on the Lord. The people, the shouting, the trumpets, God hears. And so God is there with them. And you can see the blessing of God upon the procession. Now, this did not happen in pomp and circumstance, like I said. But look again at Psalm 24, 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not worshipped idols or lied. David is passing on to us a tough lesson he has had to learn by someone dying at his command. It's his fault Uzzah died. And David is passing on this lesson. Doing things your own way brings death into your life. That's what it is. I've had that happen in my life. You've probably had it in your life, but we kind of grow dull of it. We're like, ah, you know, it's okay. But no, if we do things our own way, it allows death to come into our life. One example, Adam and Eve. All of us, all of us guys with gray hair, we're getting old because of that. You know, I'm going to look for the guys in heaven that don't have a belly button. There's two of them. Me talking to him. Dude, like what was up? Like perfect environment, perfect parent, God. No bad influence. Well, one. But you still couldn't do what God said? Come on. Anyway. God is mercifully telling us that if we want to dwell with God, we have to be clean, pure, humble, and full of truth. Religiosity isn't going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. For three months, David searched his soul and now he had holy actions fueled by pure motives and humility in his soul and true words of worship in his mouth. Can I tell you, it is extra tough to be pastor or worship leader or any stuff where you're doing this a lot. Even, the, even Aaron and his sons and all these guys, I mean, they were going through it every single day. You know how hard it is to be on all the time? It takes God's grace and mercy. Like, I'm only up here sharing with you because I know that God gives me grace. And it has mercy on me. David had to go back and reflect in the mirror and go, am I really worshiping God or am I just going through the motions? Because he was going through the motions before and someone died. And so if we want to have intimate fellowship with God, we can't just be going through the motions. So in verse 5, David writes this, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. How do we receive God's blessing? Well, David gives us a clue in Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Notice, notice this. There's no works involved. It's from the Lord. This is why Jesus came to pay for all the sins of the world, to cover our sins that we might have fellowship with God. God wants us to dwell with him, but he wants us to do it the way he's established so we don't die. God can't change, but we can. So God's salvation is the gift of God. And God's blessing is more than just his favor. It's forgiveness of iniquity it's forgiveness of transgressions and sins and iniquity. It's the imputation of righteousness and salvation. It's the place of healing, the place of victory. It's the place of your prayers being heard. It's the very constant faithful presence of God in your life. Our worship that we had, that Nikki sang, 
she did not know what I was preaching on until Wednesday night. And she's like, okay. And then she read the psalm and she's like, what songs am I going to sing? She has no idea that we're talking about the King of Glory. But all the songs that she sang, God's Holy Spirit gave to her. And he's like preparing. So you get to see in action, God doing stuff. God's presence in this church is alive and well. You see what I'm saying? So our prayers, they do not go unheard. We are dwelling in the presence of God. And so, blessed are the people whose transgressions are forgiven. Look at Psalm 24, 6. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. If we seek God, he will be found of us. Those who seek God will receive the blessing of the Lord just as David did. Salvation, the gift of God. Jesus said this in John 12, 25 through 26. Whoever loses his life, loves his life, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I fly this big airplane, right? We leave Hawaii and we're going to go someplace. And I'm either going to go to Japan, to the East Coast, or I'm going to the West. I'm going either East or West. Now, along my way when I'm flying, I might have to go around a storm. That means I have to change my heading and go this way for a while and then I'm going to correct and go around the storm and then get back on course. All right? But I'm still going that direction. I would be in a lot of trouble if I, was, if I just arbitrarily decided like, you know what, I'm just going to turn around. I think everybody in my plane would be mad. Right? Can I tell you, you are either seeking God or you are not seeking God. There is no middle ground. You are either getting closer to God or you're getting farther away from God. You might have taken a diversion. You might have had a storm in your life that put you off course temporarily. But you've got to get back on course with God. Don't turn around. Oh, forget it. And if you're going away from God, turn around. Because we want to seek after the Lord because that's where eternal life is. Why is this so important? Because Jesus is coming back. The king of glory is coming back, baby. That's right. Yeah. And it's time critical. It's time critical because God is making stuff happen. I don't know if you've noticed, but stuff's happening. Like look around the world right now. Things are happening. Like stuff that God talks about in the Bible. Like Israel's been a nation since 1948 and things are happening. God wants everybody to have a chance to get ready. God loves people. I was in New York two days ago on a trip. And um, on our layover, you know, you got to do something. So I got out and I walked around. And it was just beautiful. And I walked through uh, Rockefeller Park. It's right alongside the Hudson River. And uh, the sun's out. It's beautiful blue skies. And um, it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But of course here it's like 8 o'clock in the morning. So I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so early. But... I'm walking there and I see all these people, children playing in the park, women talking with their friends. You know, I see guys working out, playing basketball, all this life going on. And I was reminded of Nineveh, like when God sent Jonah to Nineveh. He goes, this is a great city. I have founded it. And there's so many people there. Shouldn't I have compassion on them? And God has compassion on the lost. And so this message of like, hey, get ready, the king is coming, is a message of compassion. Because God is reaching out to people. He loves his people. He loves the earth. He loves his creatures. And there's people today who know God and who are seeking him because they want a more intimate relationship with him. That's me. Is that you? Yeah, raise your hand. Show me the encouraging yeah, awesome, awesome. This is a reverse altar call. There you go, awesome. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, I expect you to raise your hand in one of the other categories here. People who don't know God and are seeking him. How many of you guys are here today? Yeah, dude, I see you. Two, three, awesome. Who else? Yeah, if you don't know God and you're seeking God, that's the way of life. I mean, that is it, baby. You get that solved, everything else starts falling into place. Then there's people who are divided of heart. And they're like, I think I know, but I'm not sure, but I'm trying, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what to do. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. And then there's people who don't know God and they don't want to have anything to do with God. You're in the right place too. 
Because God's okay with that. Let me tell you, all that stuff that we have, all that fear and like anxiety and emptiness inside, you know, you're going out, you think, oh, this, is, this car's going to be rad, it's going to make me happy. And then you get it and it's like, oh, after a while, it's like, oh, I got a door ding, no big deal. Blah, blah, new surfboard, whatever it is, new pair of shoes, ladies, whatever it is that you think you're living for, it's going to hunger again. Right? We're going to be thirsty again. And we can only find satisfaction and salvation in one place. And that's the living water that Jesus provides for us. The promise of life and that more abundantly. It only comes from Jesus. So when Jesus says the king of glory is coming, you know what he's saying also? I am not the king of glory. David's saying, I am not the king of glory. Sorry, did I say Jesus? I meant to say David said the king of glory is coming. And what he's saying is I am not the king of glory. And so when he says these things in Psalm 24, 7, he says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? It's the Lord, strong in might. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? It's the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. Yeah, baby! Right? For those of you who like were worshiping and you're like, yeah, I wish I could get into it. Do you know if you make a choice to get into it, you'll get into it more? And that's what David's saying. Get into it, man. Lift up those gates. Lift up those hands. Lift up those heads. The king of glory will come in. Remember, the glory of God dwelt with Israel from the time of leaving Egypt until we see it departing the temple in the book of Ezekiel in the time of the closing of the times of the kings of Israel. In Ezekiel 9.3, it leaves the Holy of Holies and it goes to the threshold. In Ezekiel 10.4, God's glory fills the courtyard outside. In Ezekiel 10.19, it hovers above the east gate. In Ezekiel 11.23, it's last seen, the glory of God is last seen over the Mount of Olives and presumably it went to heaven. And not long after that, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then Israel is taken into captivity for 70 years. After those 70 years, after the, after the land has served its Sabbath rest that it never got, they were able to return and rebuild the temple. But there is never again a mention of the glory of God over the mercy seat of the ark. Think about that. And in the period from 37 BC to 4 AD, Herod the Great, the king who killed all the children of Bethlehem, he built the second temple, the one that we see in the Gospels. He built that temple during that time period. But there is no mention of God's glory in that temple. And it's not until a cool evening when the shepherds are in the field minding their sheep that we see the glory of God appear. And the angels sing out, glory. Glory to God in the highest. Emmanuel is here. And then we saw Jesus growing up as a young man. Growing in the sight of man and God. And then when he announces his coming and doing his miracles, it's for the reason of the glory of God. Who sinned that this man should be born? Hey, it's for the glory of God. It's that the glory of God might be manifest. All of Jesus' miracles manifested the glory of God because in God's presence is healing, is life, is sight. All those things happening is the manifestation of God's glory. When Jesus goes to the Mount of Transfiguration, his disciples see him in his true form. And it is bright and shining brighter than the sun. That's our King of Glory. And he even told them, like, don't tell anybody this happened. I mean, they were blown away when it happened. And when he comes down, and it's the last week before he's going to be crucified, and he's kind of hanging out, and he gets a message saying, hey, Lazarus is sick. You should come and help him. And he says, okay, we're going to hang out here for a while. And then they hang out. And he goes, okay, let's go. Uh, Lazarus is sleeping. And his disciples say, hey, it's good that he's sleeping. That means he's over his flu. And Jesus goes, 
Okay, guys, Lazarus is dead. And they go, let's go up to Jerusalem. Okay, all right, here we go. And as he's coming up, Martha runs and meets him. And she goes, Lord, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. And look with me in John 11. I think we're going to put the verse up above. But John 11, 25, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And then Martha said, oh, yeah, I know in the resurrection he'll rise again at the last day. And Jesus goes, no, man, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she goes, yeah, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And so then he goes to the grave and he says, roll away the stone. And she goes, Lord, it's been like four days. He stinks. And Jesus looks at her and he says this, verse 40. Didn't I tell you that if you would just believe, you would see the glory of God? Because Jesus is God's king of glory. Jesus is the glory of God. He is the glory of God. Jesus came to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And he walked up the road and he walked in through a gate. Which gate did he walk through? I can't hear you. East gate. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, make it clear because I fly jets. Okay. East gate. And then he went to the temple. And they sent all the money changers and everybody chased them all out. And then he sat in the temple and he was there for a week while the Pharisees, the scribes, the Herodians, they all inspected the Lamb of God. And you know what it says? They could find no blemish in him. They couldn't prove anything on him. He was perfect in every way. And he always did the will of the Father. That the world may know that he is from the Father. And did they receive him? No. They rejected the Messiah. And then they crucified him and he was buried. Do you know why? Because the scriptures say so. And the scriptures must be fulfilled. And the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Do you know why? Because the scriptures say so. And the scriptures must be fulfilled. I see a common theme here. <laughs> After spending 40 days with his disciples... Letting them touch his side and touch his hands and eating with them and talking and sharing and teaching them and telling them all this stuff. And then he goes, okay guys, let's go for a walk. They walk out of Jerusalem through what gate? The east gate. And he walks down the hill past the Garden of Gethsemane. You guys, this walk is like if you were to go from Hanama Bay to like Cocoa Head. That's how close this walk is. Okay, it's their path. So you go down. There's a Kidron Valley, then there's like Garden of Gethsemane, they walk up the hill, Mount of Olives, and just on the other side, there's a little town called Bethany. And so Jesus is just a, almost to Bethany, and he gives them the Great Commission. And then the glory of God rises from Mount Olive, just like it did in Ezekiel, and it goes into heaven. Now, in case you missed it, Jesus is the King of Glory. You get that? Because I'm really dense. So I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus is the king of glory. He went in through the gate. And he came out through the gate. And the Bible says that he is coming again. Do you know why? Because the scriptures say so. And the scriptures must be fulfilled. God even said, I put my word above my name. Speaking of these gates. Ezekiel 4.22, the Lord said unto me, this gate shall be shut. It will not be opened and no man shall enter in by it because of the Lord. The God of Israel has entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. In 1541, the Islamic Sultan Suleiman sealed the gate, presumably to keep out the Messiah. But God's love for mankind is manifested in his merciful patience as his Holy Spirit calls out to all of us for people that he loves to come and dwell with him. He is giving us all the opportunity to be born again and enter the kingdom of God. This is a warning from God to all mankind that you must be clean and pure and humble and true to enter the God's holy mountain. There is no room for unbelievers. 
You cannot dwell in the presence of God if you have sin in your life. You must be born again. David talks about what it takes to enter the hill of the Lord. But, you guys, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's not just the hill of the Lord. It's the whole earth. Daniel tells us about this in Daniel 2. He says, I saw a statue and the head and the shoulders and the arms and the abdomen and the legs and the feet of clay and iron, which we're living in with the toes. And he says, and then there was a stone that fell from heaven and it hit the bottom of the statue and the statue crumbled to the ground and the wind blew and it blew away like chaff. And then the rock that hit the earth became a giant mountain that took over the whole earth. The hill of the Lord is taking over the whole earth. That's God's kingdom. That's the second coming of Jesus, like lightning from the east to the west. He's going to come and make it happen. And there's not going to be any room for unbelievers. In Zechariah 14.4, it says this, his feet will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there will be a very great valley, and half of the mountain will remove to the north, and half of it towards the south. Ezekiel tells us he'll return through the east gate after his second coming. It is for the prince. The prince, he will sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He will enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and he shall go out by the way of the same and establish his holy throne in the holy of holies. Ezekiel 43, 5 through 7. So the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold the glory of the Lord filled the house and I heard him speaking to me out of the house and the man stood by me and he said, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. Neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor their carcasses of their kings in their high places. God is coming back. His throne will be in Jerusalem and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. The lion will lie down with the lamb. There's going to be healing water that goes out from his throne and heals all the oceans. Like Fukushima Daiichi that's still pumping radioactive water in the ocean. That's going to be healed you guys. God's going to fix it all. And it's all going to be coming from Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And guess what? We're with him. Yeah, baby. Because we're in the hill of the Lord. Now listen, in the church age, we are his tabernacle. When you think about us individuals being the tabernacle of God, what, can you, what do you have to have to have God's spirit dwelling you have to have the sprinkling of the blood of the pure lamb so that your sins are covered. Jesus, hello. He spilled his blood for us. Second, where are the, where's the gate? With the mouth you speak and you ask and you say, Lord, come on in. When David says, lift up you gates, lift up you doors, make way for the king and he shall come in. Guess what? When you pray and ask God to come in, you think he's going to avoid that prayer? Like, oh, never mind. No, he's going to answer the prayer. He's going to answer you. And so he's going to come in. So the way of intimacy with God is having the sprinkling of blood of Jesus and asking the King of Glory to come in. And he will answer your prayer. Aloha, I'm Kelly. I'm the executive assistant here at One Love for the Kaka'ako campus. I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take the first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you've made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to go to forms.onelove.org slash yes, or call us at 955-9335 and let us pray with you. Our ministry leaders are ready to serve you. One last thing, if you wanna learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There, you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship book designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you are blessed by our time together. 
Aloha.